Chat with Traders, Episode 8. The biggest secret of the best traders in the world is that they're just like everyone else. However, they've worked hard to learn the markets and discover what works and what doesn't. But how can you hear about these journeys and get in on the strategies and tactics they use? You can do it by listening to Chat with Traders. Here's your host, Aaron Fifield. What's up, guys? Welcome to episode number eight of Chat with Traders. As always, it's great to have you here and thanks so much for tuning in. Now, I'm going to try to keep this intro short because we have a lot to get through in this episode. So let me give you a quick rundown on today's guest. Back in 2006, he stumbled through the doors of a prop firm with absolutely no trading knowledge. He mashed keys for a few years until the firm later shut shop during the GFC. From there, he was pretty much out on his own. And that's when he really started to grow as a trader. After gathering around about $50,000, he traded it for two years and rapidly compounded it to the tune of $2.4 million. But in perspective, this was really just the warm-up. His name is Anand Sangvi, a.k.a. Lucci, and he's now best known as the head trader at sanglucci.com. Throughout this interview, we go into much more detail about his journey about some of the hard lessons he's learned along the way. And Lucci also talks a lot about the psychology of trading. So make sure you pay extra close attention to this. It's pure gold, trust me. But before we roll into this week's interview, there's something I'm really excited to share with you. Actually, I'm excited for you guys. After recording this interview, I was able to sweet talk the lads at Sang Lucci. And they've agreed to give away their most comprehensive trading course to date which is called the Lucci Method. In fact, it doesn't even feel right to call it a course because it's just so much more. Here is what's included. Firstly, you get an online course with unlimited access to over 75 training modules with videos, written material, charts, and more. This takes you right through from the basics of options to the finest details on how to trade the same method as Lucci himself. Also included is two months access to the Sang Lucci chat room, which has an incredible sense of community and everyone gets the same respect regardless of your trading level. Plus, Lucci is in there with you throughout the day, talking through his trades and things he's watching. As part of the chat room, you also get the market regime report two times a week. On top of this, you also have two months access to the weekend sessions. This is two hours each weekend when Lucci reviews his trades from the prior week and goes over any interesting tape movements he's um, picked up from that week on a live webinar. And just when you thought there couldn't be any more, the guys are also going to throw in a one-hour coaching session with Zach Hurwitz. This guy is a beast when it comes to VWAP. I'm actually going to have him on the show in a couple weeks' time, so keep an ear out for that one. Now, this package is available and can be brought from the Sang Lucci site for $2,699. Now, that's no made-up value. That's actually what it's selling for right now. But we have one to give away, and it's super easy to enter. Just go to chatwithtraders.com forward slash giveaway. You'll need to answer one very, very simple question. You won't get it wrong. And then enter your email address. This will give you one entry to the giveaway. When you do this, you will be given a unique URL. Take that URL and share it on Twitter, Facebook, just anywhere you can imagine. Because for every person you get to enter, you score another 10 entries. So let's say you get 10 people to enter through your URL. Then your chance of winning is actually 100 times greater. So get busy, guys, and don't muck around. This competition will close at 7 p.m. on the 8th of March, Eastern Standard Time. And again, in case you missed that, go to chatwithtraders.com forward slash giveaway to enter. Now clear your head because the next 60 minutes are loaded with genuine insights that I'm certain will help you on your own trading journey. Here is this week's monster interview with Lucci. Lucci, what's going on, man? What's up, man? Not too much, not too much. It's just sort of early morning here. How about you? How's your day been? Good, good. Good day, man. Good day trading. Could nice. have been better. Could've Always been better. could have been better. Yeah, fair call. 
Are Did you, you go to the Brisbane? Uh, are you a tennis fan? I'm not. No. <laughs> I know you are though. No Australian Open for you, bro. No, no. But I believe, yeah, it's it's all happening in Brisbane. Yeah, but um, no, didn't didn't attend. So um, are you off to a good start in 2015? Uh, I mean, okay, I guess. I mean, I'm up 50 grand. Uh, I mean, my, I would say good start for me is like, you know, if I'm up at least like a half a mil kind of thing, you know. So, I mean, I'm making money. Nice, nice. Well, that's always a good start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm making money. Awesome. All right, well, man, I've got like a bunch of notes to run through, so I'm I'm pretty pumped about this interview, actually. So, um. What I'm thinking is we'll probably just break it down into three factors um, or sectors would be a better word. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how you got started um, and just sort of run through your journey from when you got started to like now. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how you're actually sort of trading the markets um, and your sort of approach to them. Sure. And I um, also want to pick your brain about um, sort of the emotions and psychology side of things because I know you're pretty big on that. So Yeah, 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 definitely. All right, sweet. Well, um, let's just kick things off by um, telling us a little bit about your background. Um, just give us a brief overview on your trading um, and then we'll zoom in, zoom in and start getting into the details. Yeah, uh, dude, I mean, that's kind of a broad thing. I have no I Honestly, this, it seems so long ago. Uh, how did I get started trading, man? I mean, I hated my job as a financial analyst. I, I absolutely hated it. Uh, I was doing like, um, what was I doing? I was doing like, uh, uh, accounting, you know, journal entries, creating pro forma financial statements, you know, end of the month kind of thing, uh, balance sheet adjustments, stuff like that. So, uh, I did that for like nine months and then I just couldn't take it. I couldn't take it. It was why I, I walked in the same, you know, this dry cubicle looking at the same spreadsheet every single day. And I just I just couldn't take it. And I remember at the same time, I had a funny story about that. There was like a weekend PlayStation 3s just came out. Right. And for or was it? Yeah, it was PlayStation 3. And I paid a bunch of kids to camp out in front of the Best Buys, you know, to make sure that because everyone had like a certain allotment. So like Target would get like six, Best Buy would get like eight, Walmart would get like two. So I paid a bunch of college kids to just – I gave them a tent and I just, I just made sure they were there, had food and everything. I paid them 300 bucks to get me a system because you could, you could pre-sell them online for like 2500 bucks. And this was all over the weekend, and I remember this was like the third Monday. I was late, and I told my boss, like, dude, I was, I, you know, I was making money selling PlayStations, and he didn't believe me. He was like, dude, are you kidding me? You got to be joking, blah blah blah. You know, he gave me all this shit, and I was like, that's it. I'm, uh, you know, I'm out. I didn't take it. I hate, you know, I have a thing with authority, you know. And and to me, I was like, I was doing all my work on time and everything. I was like, dude, what what does it matter if I'm ten to fifteen minutes late? He was like, you're irresponsible, this and that. I was like, all right, that's it. I'm out of here. You know, and prior to that, I was always like the side job kind of guy. I always had something going on on the side. So I wasn't really worried about it, you know. And, and again, it was a piddly salary, 45, 50 grand a year. Um, and I was selling tickets. I just stopped like selling tickets, uh, you know, running sort of a brokerage service for tickets for like Red Sox and things like that. So that's what I just came off of. So I always had cash sitting around. Um so I was just perusing like Craigslist at that point, uh, you know, just looking for jobs. And I was looking for something exciting, something. You know, I'm 22 at this point, uh, just had a child. You know, she was uh, one years old. I'm at home with her all day. Uh, I think I was 23. And I saw this job for an equities trader. And it was like commissions only. Um, you know, and then I walked in, it was like, it was somewhere in, in, in New Hampshire. And I don't know if you know, uh, Massachusetts or New Hampshire, but New Hampshire is like the, the, the slogan for New Hampshire is live free or die. And it's a very like, I don't know, it's a very weird town. Everybody's very liberal there in New Hampshire. And I walk into the office and it's a bunch of like 25 year old kids that look like you, honestly, they look, they all look like you. And they're just sitting in front of their computer, just banging away at the keyboard and just yelling obscenities the the whole day, and I'm looking around. I remember one kid made like 15 grand that day and bought everybody pizza, and I was like, "All right, this seems strangely. Uh, this seems like where I where I belong right here." And that's kind of how it started. 
Nice man. So you so you walked into this this prop firm and it was around about two thousand six, right? Uh yeah, two thousand six. Beginning of two thousand six. Yeah, beginning of two thousand six. Walked into this place, and then you know started trading. Uh, you know every single day, and and the the start is very difficult. Like the start of it is is probably one of the most difficult parts. I, I I wouldn't say mentally, but just figuring out what you're doing, and 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 like it's a very daunting task when you sit down and you're like, okay, this is what I'm going to be doing. Like you don't really realize it until years later. Like okay, this is what I do for a living here. You know, in the in the beginning, you're still kind of getting over the fact that you're you're doing this cool job and blah blah blah, but you still have no idea how to make money. So so yeah, it's very daunting in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, because I presume that your sort of your background and your job beforehand didn't really provide much sort of um... yeah no college you know college the job whatever your degree is even if you have a degree in finance it does not prepare you whatsoever for trading at all it doesn't it doesn't you know it it has no there's no realities of the stock market that you learn in college even in your investments class you learn zero realities of what the stock market actually is and how to do how to play it and how to do things in it uh investments you just learn theories you know, you learn what is an option, but you have no idea how to use it. You have no idea how it's priced. You have no idea how it moves, you know, so you don't know how to make money from it. Um, you know, so some people that, that go a little bit further and actually study, um, you know, investment management and things like that, they have a little bit of a better understanding. But, you know, most finance degrees or business degrees or whatever, they don't, it, you know, it doesn't prepare you for a damn thing, especially the mentally, mental aspect of it. You know, that part of it, there's no preparation for that. Yeah, yeah, they missed out the good bits. So, um, indeed, yeah. Indeed. So you, you walked into the prop firm, right? Um, I yep. mean, you had like zero knowledge of how the market even operates. Like, right. how did you know what to do, and where did you even start? Yeah, that's it's a good one. It's a good one, and 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 you know what? What everybody always does, especially if you're you know you're young or however old you are, and you're starting out in the markets, what you do is you go out and buy books, right? So you go to your Barnes and Nobles, right? And you go to your self-help section or whatever the hell it is, and you look at all the investment books, and you go to these beginner day trading online and all this nonsense here, and you start reading through this, and you start understanding what technicals are and what candlesticks are and how to look at a chart and possible entries and exits and things like that. Um, and then you start testing this stuff out. So there has to be a, a, a long period in time where you're testing out all this nonsense here and you really don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing. You don't understand what you're doing. Um, the firm, when you join a prop firm, they're supposed to give you some education. My firm, they didn't give us much. You know, It, it was all about the tape. It was all about bid and ask. But at that time, prop firms had a distinct advantage with technology and certain use of tools um, that you couldn't get. And then once 2007 and a lot of regulations changed in the market, uh, everybody became sophisticated. It was a level playing, a level, level playing field, and most prop firms shut down. You know, so so if you look out there right now, there's not that many prop firms out there. There's a couple big shops, and that's it. You know, all the little mom and pop shops, the, the place that I started at, all of them closed. Those people ain't making money anymore. You know, so so to answer your question, like. The daunting task of understanding how it was for me, it was bid and ask. It was the tape, you know, so it was just looking at where buyers and sellers were. It was going over uh, tape after the market closed. So looking at entries and exits from all the top traders in there, I would look at, OK, why? What did they see that made them want to get into this? What did they see that made them want to get out of that? And, you know, I did this for like six months for four hours a night. And finally, you know, you start you start creating a strategy for yourself. But that's what it was about. It was about creating a strategy for yourself, not taking somebody else's stuff uh, and trying to duplicate it because it was too hard to do. Those personalities were too different, you know. And again, the psychological aspect of it changes a lot. Yeah, yeah. So once you actually did start sort of trading some money, what were the sort of things you sort of struggled with the most? Um, yeah. And then how I, did you I, overcome I, those issues? Yeah, so I struggled the most with and I you know what everybody has a personality disorder, I would say, it, when it comes to trading. So it's like you you might do something great, but there's something that just holds you back all the time and it just keeps coming back and keeps coming back. So for me it was I figured out how to make money, but I always had an issue doing, you know, making dumb trades, making trades that I shouldn't be in, taking losses that I shouldn't be taking. Uh, so I always ran into the issue of 
um, you know, pulling out a forty thousand dollar month, and then the next month I ha- I was down twenty grand, or you know, and then the month after that I was up thirty five grand. The next month after that I was down fifteen grand. You know, so I was always very volatile. And one of the best things that I did, and the best things to date, um, was start swing trading um, and focusing just on one or two names versus the hustle and bustle day trade every single day, every single second of every single day, trying to make more trades to account for bad trades, whatever it was, uh, and just the real hustling every single second. Like that can get you into a lot of trouble. It can get you into over trading, you know, a lot of kinds of things that making decisions that you don't want to make. Um, you know, so that was one thing. Like 2009, I stepped away completely and I was like, you know what? If moves happen in all these stocks, like, I don't care. If I catch my one move that I've been looking for for two months, I'm good. I'm going to make 500,000. I'm going to make a million bucks. It doesn't matter, you know? So it was like the dumping of the ego thing. And it's always up and down with me. Sometimes I have the ego and sometimes I'm able to, uh, you know, push that ego back and make smart decisions, you know, and then it just comes back. It comes back. It comes back. It's like, uh, you know, it's like these these psychological issues that you always deal with, not even outside of trading, um, you know, whether it's. Uh, not being motivated to go to the gym, you know, you might be you might be there for three, four months and you, you got gains and everything. And then all of a sudden you get lazy, uh, you know, and then all of a sudden the motivation comes back. So it's the same kind of thing. Same kind of thing. Yeah. Now, those are those are some really good points you make. They're really, um, really valid, I think. So how long did it take you to develop some sort of system or method um, that you were reasonably consistent with in terms of being able to pull out a profit? Um, from the market yeah it, it took me a year and a half bro it took me a year and a half of not making <laughs> like any money whatsoever you know and that hurts that hurts for a lot of people for a lot of people that hurts and a lot of people can't do that you know let's face it everybody's got family everybody has bills you got this you got that you know so i always had my thing on the side that i was trying to make money on so whether i was selling tickets or <laughs> flipping playstations or whatever the hell it was you know i always had my thing on the side where you know i was okay you know i could i could i could make ends meet while i i i, I hustled and studied and everything with the market cuz the market is crazy because you can see the money every single day and that was that was the thing for the first year and a half like i saw the money every single day you see it you see it being made every single day but when you look at your account like you you're still broke as shit like you can't figure it out there's some there's some disconnect between all that money that you see and your account it's like why isn't that here you know what i mean like what am i not doing what are the decisions that i'm not making and most people can't get past that because it's a psychological thing you know it's 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 more you against yourself versus your particular strategy you know, the most strategies out there can work. They just have to be done and employed at the right time, uh, which most people, you know, they don't get. Why? Because they're motivated by making money every single month, you know, and then rightly so, because you got rent, you got this, you got that, you got all you got all kinds of things to pay for. So most people are motivated to make a trade for the wrong reason. And that's why most of that cash doesn't pile up. So it took me a year and a half, dude. It took me a year and a half of not making a single dollar. You know, which hurt, man. It which hurt. It was depressing at times, dude. I wanted to quit so many times, so many times, man. Um, you know, so so finally, after a year and a half, the epiphany I came to was like, it's not about the money, and that's the worst. That's the hardest part. You know, I was too uh, fix it, fixated on the money, making a hundred thousand a month, making you know whatever it was, ten grand a month, twenty grand a month, thirty grand a month. I was so fixated on the dollar amounts every single day, every single trade. Uh, and that's all bullshit. It's just about the trade. It's it's all about the trade. It's all about what the action is, you know, and then making the right decisions based on the action that you see. But you get so motivated by the money because, again, it's money, you know, it's real money. So so that was the epiphany that I kind of had after a year and a half. Most people don't even get to there until, you know, four years, five years down the line after they've blown out so many different accounts. Of course, yeah. So, I mean, that side hustle sort of helped you get through the struggle definitely. period while you were sort of learning your feet. Definitely, uh, definitely. Uh, yeah, so following a stint at the, the prop firm, uh, what was your next move from there? Yeah, so funny thing, man, with the prop firm was was 
that was at the time where the markets were crashing in 2008. That was at the subprime blow up, the subprime meltdown. Um, and in 2008, you know, markets went from 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 skyrocketing to absolute shit. And what happened was was that prop firms back in the day, like there was no regulation on proprietary trading firms back in the day. So as long as there was, let's say, an account with a few million bucks in it. Um, you know, there was a relationship with a brokerage that would allow you a significant leverage on that money, but it all worked on pooled, pooled accounting. So, so basically all that leverage was doled out to however many traders that was, that was in the prop firm. The problem was is that if one trader took like a bad hit or a bad beat or something, it would affect everybody else. So the head traders were buying uh, banks on the way down. Uh, you know, they were buying Bear Stearns on the way down. Bear Stearns opened one day at sixty bucks, and then the next day it opened up at ten bucks. These guys were long at sixty bucks. You know, so they got crushed. They didn't tell anybody about it, and I had to figure this out years later. You know, they didn't tell anybody about it, and then all of a sudden I came in one day. Uh, expecting to, you know, crank it out, make some crazy money, and I'm cut down to a hundred share lot. Okay, so prop firms, your head trader has you uh, down to uh, restrictions as far as lot sizes that you can trade. You know, I was uh, nobody gave a damn about me because I was making money at the time, so so I could trade whatever the hell I wanted to. And then all of a sudden, I come in and I'm only allowed to trade a hundred shares. You know, two hundred shares. That means like my max P and L could be like two hundred bucks. And I was like, dude, what the fuck is this? What did you do to me? What what happened? What's going on? And then everybody was like, oh, you know, the head traders were like, no, we're not shutting down. We're not shutting down. Two days later, we come into work, doors locked, and nobody's there. Doors locked and nobody's there. And then you know the whole thing shut down. The whole parade shut down. Every single trader out there filed out, and you know most of them weren't making money at that point anyway. You know, so it was only me and this one other guy that were making making we're making ridiculous money on the way down, just shorting everything. And then I was like, all right, screw this. I'm going to go swing trade. You know, I'm going to take this money that I have, which was about, I don't know, like 70 grand in cash, maybe. And I combined it with my pops money. And I was like, all right, that's it. I'm going to start swing trading. At that point, I didn't even know anything about options. So I was just buying low price stocks and flipping them, you know, buying 50,000 shares, 100,000 shares and flipping them a couple of weeks later for double, you know, double, triple, triple the money. It was, it was, it was a great time to swing uh, equities at, at, at that time. So this was like beginning 2009. Okay. And I believed you um, sort of compounded that pretty quickly within the next two years. Yeah, yeah, man. 2009 was was unbelievable. I mean, it was a place where I mean, Las Vegas Sands was like two bucks. You know, it was like a dollar. Citigroup hit a buck. You know, all these names just just washed out to nothing. So you could trade equities and double your money in an equity in a big, large cap stock in like a day or like a week. So it was nuts, man. I, I would rack up 50,000 shares, 100,000 shares of these things and just collect, collect. I remember one month, you know, I, I finally, I had a half a million dollar month and then, uh, you know, and then I started trading options. Then I started trading options aggressively, trying to figure out options. Uh, and it took me a while. It took me a while. It took me a, a good portion of the beginning in 2009 to figure out what the hell an option was and how to use it. Um, and then finally, summer 2009, I, I you know, amassed a huge position in some uh, bank options and crushed it, you know, made a good couple million in, in, a, in a few months. Nice. Very nice. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. So these days you're probably best known as um, the head trader um, at St. Lucci. So um, tell us a yeah. little bit about what you're doing over there. Like where did the idea come from and how did it all get started? Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, uh, so I would say after 2009, you know, you, you're you're on a high. Remember, I, like I was only 26, right? And I, I, you know, I made a boatload of money. So you couldn't tell me anything. My ego was like at an all time high, you know what I mean? So so at that point, like, uh, I think I, I took a, like a big loss. I took a big loss. It was like 400 grand. And this was like the worst loss that I've ever taken, you know, and I'm just sitting there like looking at my computer screen. I'm looking at my P and L down 400,000. I'm like, dude, you are the biggest piece of shit, you know, on the planet. There, there's no reason that you should even be alive right now. So, you know, I kind of just, I kind of just buckled and I, and I just gave it up for a little bit. I was like, you know what? I made a bunch of money. You know that's it. My, I, you know, my father retired. Basically, he didn't have to work anymore, and uh, and that, and that was it, man. So, so, dude, I just had a bunch of money and traveled and enjoyed myself and everything. 
and I invested in all these stupid businesses and made all kinds of stupid decisions with my money. And, um, you know, needless to say, I came to an epiphany again after looking at my bank account and looking at my lifestyle and being like, all right, uh, <laughs> how are you going to how are you going to do this for the rest of your life? You need more money. So then I was like, all right, that's it. I got to go back to work. Um, so I created sanglucci.com. And I always enjoyed writing, dude. I mean, one thing that I always enjoyed was writing. And I ha I always had a knack for it. I always had a, a, a sort of – mine was always humor. It was always like sarcastic humor kind of thing. That was, that was always my thing. And I would look at all the financial news. And you remember, this is, this is like back in 2011 um, or 2010 even. And you know, most people used Yahoo Finance and you know, maybe Market Watch or Minionville or places like this. And most of the articles that you read was it was just horrible to read anything that was going on in finance. And then, and then I I always felt there was so much manipulation from what was being put out there and what was actually happening in the markets. So I was like, all right, this is this is ridiculous. I gotta make some comments here. I gotta I gotta show the I gotta show finance the way that I see it and the way that I see it in the, in the trading world every day. So that's what I did. I just started writing. And people enjoyed it. People enjoyed it. And, uh, you know, but building a website and marketing and all that kind of stuff, you know, I was picking that up on a fly. Uh, I remember sitting in the library just reading like HTML books and CSS books and figuring out how to put a website together, you know. So the first versions of com were absolutely miserable. Um, you know, nowadays, like you can't even have a bullshit website. Like you can't even have a whack website. If you have a whack website now, like people just click right off of it. You know, 2010, 2008. Like you could still get away with having a blog spot, uh, uh, you know, of 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 of, uh, of a website, uh, or just some blogger type website that looked like shit. People would still go to it. Now, like you can't have websites like that if it's not glitz and glam, or it's not functional, and it's not so quick. And people don't even want to be on it. And if it's not mobile uh, friendly, like nobody's nobody's even going to spend any time on it. Um, so, anyways, that's how it started. I, I just started writing randomly, and you know, built a good following, and then realized that I could, I could basically just like the side hustle that I was doing, you know, back in two thousand eight. I could do the same thing with the website, you know, keep some cash flow coming in. Uh, as far as chat rooms, as far as education, as far as things like that, while I try to go hit it again, you know, in the markets, hit it big again in the markets. So I started back with a hundred grand. Um, uh, it was really tough, man. That first year coming back trading was tough, was so tough. Because, dude, when you take a break from trading and you come back, you already expect yourself to be winning just like you were before, and it doesn't happen like that. Like you gotta, you gotta understand the markets again. You gotta understand how to move again. You gotta understand the emotions again. So it takes a while to get back in the game, man. So that's what that's uh, that's basically how it happened. That's how SangLucci.com started, and that was just me. That was just me, you know. So now. Uh, it's evolved to so much more. It's evolved to so much more. I have partners. Uh, you know, we were out in New York. We moved out to New York, uh, and I'm sure we'll get into that story soon enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's dive into it now, man, because, I mean, you've partnered with cool. um, Hain Bodek, I mean, who is pretty much yeah. like the authority figure on high-frequency trading and automation. Yeah. So tell us about yeah, how that yeah. came about. Like, what are you guys working on? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you know, fast forward here, uh, you know, I had a website, um, was doing pretty well. Uh, you know, I, I, I went through a couple of different business partners because, you know, having business partners is difficult too. Um, finally, linked up with these two guys that I met at a uh, Tim Sykes uh, trading conference. And this was like back in 2011, maybe. Or maybe the end of 2010 or something like that. And uh, there was a guy named there. Uh, his name was Peter Zhang. He worked with the Bulls on Wall Street crew. And, you know, we're just taking sake bombs and, and, and nonsense. I like I have this dope room at the Venetian, you know, so I'm balling out over there in Vegas just doing dumb shit. And, um, you know, we're, we're sitting there. We're having sake bombs. And Peter's like, yo, we should start a hedge fund. I'm like, yeah, all right, whatever, buddy. Um, and so he linked me up with a friend of his, Charlie, who lived out in L.A. with him. And, you know, we got on the phone and these two, these two, these two were really sharp individuals. Um, 
And I was like, listen, if you can put this together and you can put this in front of enough people here with this track record that we have, let's do it. Screw it. I'll do it with you. And they did it. They put in the back end work on, uh, you know, the, 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 the legal work on setting up the hedge fund and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, they showed a lot of promise as far as what they could offer for the website, uh, uh, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So, so we decided to move to New York because to set up in New York – uh, you know, there wasn't as many uh, hedge fund sort of restrictions, uh, you know, that you find in Boston or a lot of other uh, uh, cities across the nation. So New York was like the best place for us to go. Uh, so we were like, screw it. That's it. We all packed up, left where we were and uh, rented out this dope loft downtown Manhattan, um, which which cost like nine grand, ten grand a month kind of thing. We all just split it up. We all just split it up. Um and it was a really dope place. We threw a ton of crazy parties. We'll get into that. Uh, and then we just started trading there. We just started trading there. I was just trading there. We started running the site together, writing articles together, uh, bringing new people into the loft from New York, from the New York trading scene and everything. And then Heim came around because we had just finished reading that book, Dark Pools. Uh, and I don't know if any of you guys have read it, but this is, this is a book called Dark Pools by Scott Patterson, and it's all about the the move and the shift towards electronic markets. Uh, but deeper, even deeper than that, it's how uh, you know the creation of all these ATS uh, systems came about. You know, all these dark pools, all these ECNs, uh, and it's just kind of it just kind of really showed the back end of the trading world which nobody ever talks about and these were all the answers that so many traders were looking for myself included and there was this guy in there it was it was about a lion's portion of the book was about uh heim bodek and i'm like dude this guy is awesome this guy is great man uh, charlie was the one who read it and and you know all of us were like dude let's hit him up and we found him on twitter you know peter started emailing him calling him we said hey listen just come by the house come by the crib and he came by and he just talked his talked our ears off. And eventually, you know, he was at that time where he was looking for something. And we were also looking to partner up with him as well. So that's the dude. That's how it started, man. Just from Twitter. Just from Twitter, man. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome, man. Um, yeah, I've, I mean, I first discovered um, Hayne Bodek um, in that documentary, uh, The Wall Street Code. Wall Street Code. Yeah, and that's yeah. actually so that it, came after. You know, that came after. Yeah, you know, right. and and we had, you know, and, and Charlie had the deals and everything to make that to make that happen. You know, for for Haim, that was a huge documentary, huge documentary that went down. Uh, really explained a lot to to a lot of people about uh, the markets, about high frequency trading, about how it worked, about the deceptive practices and all that kind of stuff. You know, so Haim came in and really just blew our blew our whole world up and showed us showed us the other other side of the market which we've been wanting to know about and understand for the longest time yeah that's an incredible documentary i'll, I'll put a link to that in the show notes actually um, definitely. definitely yeah yeah i mean that's actually how i first sort of um heard about yourself and um what you guys are doing over there at saying lucci um, yeah in that documentary because you featured in it for like i don't know five ten minutes at, at one point yeah we're in there we're in there we're in the mix you know and we're like the other side you know we're the other side of the game we're the we're the side of the game that that knows that it's there we understand that high frequency trading is using our order flow to create opportunities and arbitrage opportunities for fractions of pennies and i see them doing it to me all the time with with a lot of of the orders that i send out you know so this is like us now finally understanding and this is now the sophistication of people like myself, of other traders, of even retail guys who don't who don't necessarily know or have that much experience in the markets, you know, everybody is slowly becoming more sophisticated because the access to this information is huge now with dark pools and with the Wall Street Code, uh, Michael Lewis, the, you know, the the uh, the 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 Flash Boys, that, the Flash Boys book that uh, you know he just came out with, you know, so all this is going on right now. Everybody now is in tune with the actual structure of the markets, which. Nobody ever was, you know, nobody ever was. And still you find a lot of retail guys that, that, that are clueless completely. But now like everybody is getting more sophisticated in their knowledge of how the market works, which is, which is great that we're here. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy stuff. Like I've, I've watched that documentary like a couple times and um, I'll probably watch yeah. it a few more yet. Like I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But, um, definitely. It's, it's really interesting. So um, I mean now's probably a good point to sort of zoom in a little bit on your actual approach to trading. So 
How would sure. you define your style as far as trading the markets? Like you mentioned earlier, um, you sort of were leaning towards swing trading. Is that still the case like today? No, 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 man. And, and, but, but again, like I always try to go back there. I'm always trying to get back there. And it is weird in trading. Like you go through these different evolutionary patterns uh, within yourself, within your abilities, within your mindset. It, it's just trading is a very – it's it's very connected towards your lifestyle as well, you know, how you're living at that current time. Like me out in New York was pumped up with ego, man, pumped up with ego. You know, we had this giant loft. We, everybody was coming to us for information. Everybody was coming to us on Twitter. Everybody was coming to us just to be a part of the movement. Um, you know, so so I was driven purely on ego. Dude, I was going out every single night, coming home at like 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning and waking up two fucking hours later to trade. You know what I mean? And it didn't phase me. It didn't phase me. It didn't phase me at all. It was just what you did. Um you know, so that was me in, in New York City, you know, uh, as far as me trading, what happened was in 2010, they came up with weekly options. And this really changed a lot for me, especially and for, uh, you know, price movements on actual equities. Um, it opened the door for a lot more uh, manipulation as far as uh, uh, sentiment and perception manipulation on uh, options, where to buy it, where to sell it. Um, you know, so there, there was a lot of games that were being played that I wasn't used to as soon as the weekly options came out. And then they provided this sort of lure of crazy money within very short time frames. So I went back to day trading, uh, you know, and and – now, needless to say, I, I wouldn't say it was the best decision here um, because swing trading and when you're, when I'm looking at just one or two or three names and I'm sitting there just waiting for that big picture move to happen, it might be a couple of months, it might be two months, three months, whatever, you know, that's when I'm at my best, I would say. Um, but as far as trading and my style, it's all tape. Everything is tape. It has nothing to do with charts. It has nothing to do with fundamentals. Uh, you know, it has a little bit to do with price levels and things like that, where a lot of people are trying to buy a stock or sell a stock or whatever. But everything is about the tape. And what I mean with the tape is what are what 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 is the interaction between the buyers and sell sellers currently within this stock? Um, and then how long can it last? So, for example, like if I see a lot of buying taking place on a particular name, it's assessing how much demand there is and how long that's going to last. And then also combining it with what's going on in the market, what's going on as far as the uh, the, the economy, uh, global economy, you know, all that kind of nonsense. You combine that all together to give yourself sort of a time frame on how long you want to hold something. So everything is to me is buyers and sellers. It's all simple supply and demand for me. I don't use anything snazzy, uh, you know, no moving averages, no technical indicators, none of that mumbo jumbo because now, you know, like I said before, the sophistication of the players that own this market, meaning the market makers, smart money hedge funds, uh, all these guys that literally run the markets, you know, these guys are using all those things that the retail mindset goes to trade, you know, like uh, candlesticks, uh, technical indicators, all that kind of stuff. So, so they use all that stuff against you now. Uh, they're that sophisticated, you know. They're they are that sophisticated. Their programs are that sophisticated, um, you know, to 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 literally crush the the retail investor who doesn't know what he's doing. You know, so that's the game that's being played now. So that's why I always come back to what's true, and what's true is price, is tape. Is bid and ask. That's it. So, are those sort of indicators and those sort of other different, um, you know, things you mentioned there? Are they things you previously used to use, and now you've just sort of cut it right down to the tape? Is I, that I, what you know? To be honest, to be honest, I never, I never actually used them. Uh, you know, but I, I did, I did look at a lot of charts and things like that, but I never actually used them. I, oh, I was always against them. I, I never could understand like the crowd mentality, you know, it was always to me, the herd mentality. Uh, and, but there was a great period in time where it worked it, that worked, you know, back in the eighties and back in the nineties, technical analysis worked, that stuff worked, you know, because everybody was behind it and there wasn't that much manipulation. There wasn't that many computers, uh, you know, algorithms in the game at that. 
that time. Now, most of the time that you're trading, you're trading with a computer. You know, you're not trading somebody else. You're trading with a computer, whether it's a computerized uh, market making system, uh, uh, you know, a smart money hedge fund or whoever it is. You know, that's who you're trading against. You're not trading against some other freaking human. You know, you are trading against a sophisticated system is taking the other side of your trade. You know, and you got to think about that. You know, so 2007, that's when regulation NMS came in and all of the st the whole structure of the markets changed completely. And that's when the computers took over. It, it was like overnight, man. The computers took over and you could see it in the tape, man. Everything changed. Yeah, that's 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 not so. um I mean, what's the sort of info that you're actually pulling from the um, from the tape that's actually influencing your decision on to place a trade? Yeah, um, this one's a tough one. This one's the, uh, something that you have to see. You know what I mean? You have to see it being done. It's it's like that same thing. Uh, you know, with with tape, everybody says tape is like a lost science or a lost art simply because like there's no information about it. There's no there's no books out there that you can really sit there and read about the tape. It's more of a feel thing. It's more about understanding buyers and sellers, how they interact with one another. And when you have a large player that is accumulating, let's say, blocks of shares or a million shares or two million shares, they have footprints. You know, they have footprints. They have a distinct way that they're going about buying those shares you know and that's kind of what i'm watching for i'm watching for the bigger players building into a position uh and then finally they went ahead they let it go and that's when you see the stock either going to the moon or going down to the depths you know it's where these big big breakouts and big breakdowns can happen where where really sharp price movements can happen within a short period of time i'm looking for those spots that's what i'm looking for you know and i'm trying to assess buyers and sellers, and again, who's involved, who's manipulating that tape, and trying to figure out, okay, who's behind it, why are they behind it, and what are they doing? That's that's basically it. Okay, cool. So what sort of influence does things like news releases and rumors have on your trading, if any, or do you just sort of stay focused on reading the tape, like it's all factored into the tape already? Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's a little different now. Like before, ten years ago, like you could trade a news release. You know, you you really could. There was enough time for you to be able to do it. Now, anytime there's a news release, like the news algorithms pick it up so quickly and make these moves happen within fractions of a second that anytime you try to get involved in this, you're the last one to the party. You're the last one to the party, and there's no way you're making any money here. So I always trade after the news release. I'll always trade after the news release. I, I will never try to anticipate a, a you know some kind of a news release being in my favor or whatever because you never know how it's going to affect the markets. You know you could you could look at a simple earnings call. You know you could take out most earnings calls that uh, that uh, you know that came out like you you take Alcoa which kicked off earnings season this year. You know it was positive earnings, great earnings, and the stock absolutely tanked. It opened up. You know, a little bit higher and then tank two points over the next two days just because of the timing of where the market was. So oftentimes news releases and things like that, they don't matter. They don't matter. They're used more as a place to manipulate people into believing a certain direction. You know, so I'll trade that after once I understand what they're doing with that particular news release. You know, so I'll, I'll try to stay away from it and trade after. Yeah, you've got to be, got to be careful what you listen to. So um, by following Definitely. the tape you're pretty much getting as close as you possibly can to the current price action. That is the closest. That is the closest. That's the closest that you can get. And that's why I always come back to it. You know, I mean, most people are using all these other indicators. These things are lagging indicators by God knows how long. You know, when you understand the tape and you understand buyers and sellers, that's when you understand how the market works from a fundamental level, how buyers and sellers have to interact with another with with each other to get an order filled, you know, and and to get a significant amount of orders filled. You know, they have to do they have there's certain actions that need to be taken. And when you can see that happen. You know, that's when you're really in tune with the markets. You're not looking at some 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 nice looking picture here on a chart formation and saying, OK, this is what's going to happen. You know, that stuff is nonsense. Um, the real the real information is in reading, being able to read the buyers and sellers. OK, OK, cool. So just to be clear that the type is the same as level two. Yes, yes. So tape is level two and time and sales. So level two being your bid and, and ask and 
time and sales being your transactions, the actual transactions and orders that take place. Uh, tape can also refer to options as well. So oftentimes you'll see action in the options, big buyers and sellers of the options that end up uh, moving the markets too. So vice versa. So, so tape includes all of that price uh, action as well. Okay, awesome. So once you're actually into a trade, I mean, how you determine your sort of your exit point slash risk? Um, and if things go sour, um, and I mean, on the other hand, how are you deciding where you take profits? Yeah, yeah, this is, a, this is always the tough one. And, and one of the things that I'm great at is my entries. One of the things that I'm subpar at is my exits. You want to know why? Because exits often get a little emotional, right? Because let's say I'm up in a trade, up 100 grand or something like that. I'm looking at my P&L up 100,000, and I'm saying to myself, eh, maybe I can scratch another 10,000. Maybe I can scratch another 20,000. Maybe I can scratch another 50,000. And your mind all of a sudden gets glued or fixated on making the 150,000, you know, on looking at your P&L at 150,000. And all the while you're looking at your tape and it's telling you to get the hell out and you're not doing anything because you're still fixated on your P&L being a certain way. Uh, you know, so exits can really get botched when emotions come into the picture or you add your own soundtrack to the trade, which you can't. Because the trade doesn't give a shit about what you think. Uh, the trade doesn't give a damn about you know how much money you want to make out of it. The trade is just the trade. Uh, so exits, I'm at my best when I'm slowly, uh, slowly limiting out into strength, uh, and then by the time it's the top of the move, I'm pretty much out of the option completely. You know, if I wait until that last moment to sell my options, that's when that's when the bad things happen. Because if you wait until the last moment. You're fixated on that P&L staying the same. There's no way it's going to stay that same. And if you wait until the last moment, whatever price on your option that you're trying to get, you're not going to be able to get that with the full size that you have. I never do. you know. And that price disappears real quickly when everybody else is running for the exit too. So they'll push the price of that option down like crazy and have you looking at a P&L that you didn't want to look at. you know. So the way that you have to do it best is, is to sell out into the strength. You know? So whether if you're, short, if you're on the short side, slowly sell your options as it's working uh, in your favor so that by the time you know, the, 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 the stock has moved to you know, its, its final low or high or whatever it is, you know, you're out of most of your position. This is a difficult thing to do because, again, emotions are there the whole way. How do you not know it's going to keep going? How do you not know that, uh, you know, the thing's going to pull back, you know? So there's so many different things that you have to be account for and be dynamic and act dynamically uh, as a result, which most people, again, they can't do. Yeah, man, exactly. Um, valid points, valid points. So having the skill set of being able to effectively read the tape, is that what you would say gives you an edge in the market? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. 100% that is my edge. And dude, it's funny that you say that, is that US equity markets are so mature. They're so mature in the sense that there's no I – mean, anybody who says I have an edge, chances are they, they, you know, they might have an edge for a couple of months where they're making some money, and, and that's it. There's no real arbitrage or that edge left in the markets unless you're looking at it from the computer perspective. So if you're just a regular human, you're a retail guy. There's no true edge left in a mature market like this. There is on the computer side because the computers, again, they're not swayed by the emotions. They can pick a certain type of, uh, you know, type of situation, account for all these other conditions, and make sure that they're only doing that. Make sure that they're only doing that. Whereas retail guys, we are swayed by our emotions, which make whatever edge that you might have – uh, discernible, you know, it, it might make that edge completely disappear. Uh, whereas the tape reader, I feel like still has that edge. The retail guy who is still, who, who, who understands how to read the tape, he still has that edge because he can still find where that money is going to be, uh, and how to get it, uh, just simply by reading the tape. Uh, you know, so I, I still think, you know, that's where the true edge, as far as just a human manual trader is, you know, still left in this market. Everything else is accounted for. Everything, every other strategy you can possibly think of, whether it's options, equities, or whatever the hell it is, that shit is accounted for, it's documented, somebody has computerized that strategy, any edge whatsoever 
has been taken and it's spoken for. Okay, cool. So um, just sort of going back to your trading more specifically. So you're trading pretty much every day, sort of day in, day out. Um, are there ever days when you feel like you should not be in the markets because nothing's really lining up or looking like a good opportunity? Like, how do you avoid forcing trades? Right. Every other day, this happens. And, and again, this is the human aspect. This is the human failure uh, when it comes to trading. You know, it, when you know in your head, like, hey, listen, there's no opportunity here. There's nothing for me to do. But you are motivated. And remember, where this goes back to us saying, uh, the motivation for making a trade uh, is most of the time, you know, the 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 at at fault of the human. And because wh- what are those motivations? What are those motivations? Those motivations are I need to make my rent money. Those motivations are I have losses to make back. Those motivations are I want to buy a house next year, you know, so I need some money for a down payment. Those motivations are I want to get a better apartment. Those motivations are all kinds of dumb things that the market doesn't care about. It doesn't care about. But we add that soundtrack to the market, which causes us to force trades. And this is one of the biggest flaws of any human trading, uh, you know, any human trading. And again, you have to hit that root, the root of why you're making the trade in the first place. And, and most traders need to fail before they can see the light. You know what I'm saying? They need to fail several times before they can realize like, oh my God, if I just cut out these bad days or these days where there's no, there's no money to make, you know, I'm sitting on millions here, you know, but it's so difficult to do that in the heat of the moment. And this is one of the big flaws of human trading, which computers have solved that. They, they, computers have essentially solved that situation. Yeah, that's great. I like the way you sort of sum you know? that up. So yeah. So as far as me being able to do it, like, dude, sometimes I'm good at it. Sometimes I'm not. So sometimes I can look at the market and say, dude, I ain't going to make shit and I can step away and I can go do other stuff. But other times when let's say I got, uh, you know, a month of losses to make back, you know, I'm there plugging away at the keys. And then all of a sudden I look at the end of the day. I'm like, dude, why did I, why did I do that? You know? So it's still back and forth for me as well. That's still something that I'm struggling with too. I'm not ashamed of, of, of admitting that. Yeah, cool. So um, we sort of touched on this a little bit before, but I just sort of want to expand on a little bit. And that's sort of like, I mean, I've heard you talk about the need to adapt to the new market and the importance of remaining flexible. Um, So I'm keen to hear more about this as in what do you mean by the new market? And if possible, could you give us an example of how you've had to change your own day-to-day trading um, to be able to adapt? No doubt, no doubt. I, I got so m- I have so many different examples for this. Um, I'll, I'll do I'll do the one where where the weekly options came out. When weekly options came out, price moves and the same breakouts that I looked for before they happen so much more quickly. Everything is happening so much more faster. And again, there's a, there's another reason for that too. Um, and and it's a little bit sophisticated here in theory, and it, and it's tough for people to kind of understand it. Um, but let's just say that in 2009, when I was trading my one stock, two stocks, you know, I had weeks to develop a big position in a stock. You know, before before I'd get my move, I had so much time on my hands to be able to do that. Once the weekly options came out, I had maybe a day. I had maybe a day. It cut me down to a day where I needed to get this position. Because it was so much more manipulation. There was so much more uh, manipulation of price action. There was so much more fake outs. There was so much more false activity, false breakouts, false breakdowns. Um, you know, And I had literally a fraction of the time uh, to amass the size of positions that I wanted to get. You know, So me building a quarter million in an option is so much more difficult now. Than it was in 2009 and 2008. I could do that in 2009, 2008. Now, when I go, to, when I try to put that size out there in an option, market makers know me. They can see me coming a mile away. They can see me coming a mile away. They know exactly what I'm doing. And then the games, then the games start. Then it's me against these guys who have more money and more time available to them to shake me out of my position. And to, and to literally give them the contracts for 50%, 60%, 70% discount. And then all of a sudden, my move happens that I've been waiting for. I'm not in it anymore. They own my contracts. 
And they literally waving at me. They're literally waving goodbye to me, you know, while all this money is on the table. So there's so much more that goes into uh, what I do as far as fighting against, uh, you know, smarter players, people that have more money, people that have more time on their hand. Um, there's so much more to it now from the changes in the market. Uh, than 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 before. So you you have to grow. You have to become more sophisticated. You have to start playing the games with them. You have to get sophisticated as far as your how you execute your orders, where you send your orders to, how you send your orders. Um, you know. So that that can, that's that's a great example right there. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that. That's a, that's a really good example. So um, I mean, I couldn't have you on without um digging into the psychology of trading, um, the emotional roller coaster many of us ride, and uh, the mental side of things. So. Let's dig into a little, a little bit more on that side of things. So um, what are some of your best tips to uh, sort of keep a handle on your emotions? Um, do you have any sort of advice on the subject that you wish someone shared with you when you're starting out? Yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. Like you go through so many different emotional stages of your life, you know. So, so you got to remember like whatever – Whatever environment that you have around you, that's what's going to influence your decisions and that's what's going to influence your emotions. So, for example, when I was 23, 24, you know, I just had a I just had a baby. Uh, You know, my thing was all about, you know, how do I how do I make sure I got rent and all that kind of stuff covered every single day? You know, so so when I went about trading, it was all about, OK, how do I make four thousand a month? How do I make four thousand a month? How do I make you know, how do I make this this kind of money a month? And I wasn't looking at the big picture. I was never looking at the big picture um, simply because like what my environment decided and, you know, decided how I was going to live, how I was going to make decisions. Um, you know, so whatever you're going through at the time, you always have to be bigger than that. You know, you always have to take a step outside and look at what you're going through and realize that in trading, none of that shit matters. None of it matters. And it's so difficult to do this. It's so difficult to do this, to step away from having to make money, to step away from, um, you know, living, living a certain lifestyle or requiring a certain lifestyle. It's so difficult to step away from all this stuff. Um, and I would say the one most important thing that I wish somebody told me was that to not think about the money when I'm trading, you know? And, and again, you know, this is not something that you learn overnight, but it's something that if you have it in the back of your head when you're starting, you know, you're closer to the bigger picture than I was, you know, so it took me years to figure that out, you know, and it was all always about to your, your, your lifestyle, like trading can consume you and does consume a lot of people to the point where they don't leave their houses, you know, they don't go out, they don't, they don't talk to people, you know, they, they become very secluded and lonely and loners, you know, simply because like they're, they're slaves to their P and L every single freaking day, you know, and that's all it's about. And that's not what it's about, you know? So living a healthy lifestyle and, and, you know, enjoying time with friends, whether you're down on your account or down on the year or you're up or whatever, you know, having a life is so important to being on an even keel, uh, you know, when you're sitting there in front of the in front of the computer, in front of the trading screen, you know, so always thinking about that big picture, uh, which, again, most people stop thinking about it the second they have problems trading or the second they have problems in their environment that they have to deal with. And then subsequently, those problems affect their trading decisions. And that's all it is. You know, most of the de- most of the bad decisions that you make are a direct result of y- of your environment or you, th- you projecting the problems that you're having in your environment or in your life onto the market, onto a market which doesn't give a shit about it. We're just, just talking pure probabilities. Market doesn't care if you got issues. You know, it doesn't give a damn. But you're going to project that onto the market – Simply because that's what's going on in your life. That's what you're thinking about. You know, you're thinking about rent. You're thinking about this. You're thinking about, you know, how shitty your life is maybe at that time or how great your life is at that time. You know, you're thinking about all those things and you're projecting this onto a probability mechanism, a market which doesn't give a shit. You know, so that's that's a, that's the biggest thing I could say. You know, keep thinking about the big picture. Don't don't fall into the day to day, you know, hustle and bustle of the market all the time. Realize that the market's not going anywhere. There's going to be money to make tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the day after that. You know, so so don't don't get too wrapped up in every tick uh, of 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 the markets. You know. Yeah, man. Top top advice. So um, 
still tying in with that emotions and psychology sort of thing, how do you keep the confidence up to push on and pull the trigger um, after a run of losing trades? <sighs> this one's tough. This one's tough, man. It's tough. It's like it's like <laughs> It's like taking a bad beat. It's always like taking a bad beat. It it, it it takes time. Everything is about time. You know? So let's say you get you get you get a run of bad cars or you get a couple shitty months where you take a bunch of losses. Uh, you know, it just takes time. It takes time for you to step back and realize what happened. And then it takes time for you to stop being uh, uh depressed. Like humans have this 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 uh innate sort of ability to 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 what is what is the word I'm thinking of self doubt or to beat themselves up you know after something bad happens like humans always go through a period of time where they beat themselves up about it they're like dude I shouldn't have done this I shouldn't have done this I shouldn't have done this right they kick themselves in their ass too hard and it takes a while to 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 work out of that process and to start feeling more confident about yourself to start feeling you know like you actually can do this you know what I mean I mean you know during a period of bad losers you know, there's nothing in the world that feels feels as bad. I mean, again, obviously there's worse situations everywhere, but it, you know, it's a horrible feeling in the pit of your stomach. You're just like, dude, can I even do this anymore? Um, and it takes time. It always takes time to come back out of that scenario. And that's again why it's so important to stay on that even keel, to to continue to live your life and enjoy your life, and to continue to have other things around you that you're motivated by as well. It can't just be about the markets all the time, you know. So that will help those, uh, you know, those periods of self doubt and you know you're beating yourself up, depression and all that kind of stuff. You know that will help making those periods a lot smaller, so you can uh, you know automatically bounce back and jump back into the game. You know, for me, it's like. It's like two months or three months where I sort of like size down. I'm like quiet, uh, you know, and then finally once I get once I get a couple of winners, I am you know, I'm ready to get back in there. Awesome. Awesome. So let's just jump right to the other end of the spectrum right now. And that's, um, you know, I've, I've heard you in the past sort of talk about when you did start to make it as a trader, um, the people around you began to change a little bit. So, um, yeah. you know, they weren't necessarily supporting you when you were coming up. Um, and sort of going through that struggle zone, like that sort of be like, you know, what are you doing? Why are you trading? Waste of time, get a job, you know, like that sort of mentality. So, you know, ha- how did you deal with that sort of scenario? And I mean, yeah. sort of what, what happened with you? Yeah, man. I mean, that's a great thing that you asked that. And I'm sure you probably asked that to, you know, a lot of other successful traders as well. And, uh, and I'm sure like everybody has a different way of answering this, but there are some people that are, there are more self-confident, self-aware than others, right? And you take a trader that has some success, right? Sitting on a few million bucks or sitting on however much money. And all of a sudden, like everybody around them changes. Everybody around them starts, you know, starts starts looking at them differently. And you can see it in the rise, the way they look at you and the way they talk to you. They talk to you with this respect that, you know, you never saw before. And you start getting used to that. You start you start feeling more powerful. You start feeling more uh, more important. You start feeling, uh, you know, all these things that you never really felt before. And to some people who, let's say, are easily swayed or might be have sort of an addictive personality, you know, that ends up taking them over. And and you start to realize like they change as well. They start to only have these people around them that that want something from them or or say yes all the time to them. Or or, or let's face it, at the end of the day, they're not real. They're not they're not real. They're just there because you're, you know, you're the you're the you're the power guy. You're in the power position. They're just there. You know, women especially. Women that won't talk to you before and all of a sudden you got a little money in your pocket. You know, these women now want to know your name and they want to hang out with you and all that. It's bullshit, you know, at the end of the day. But a man or a woman who is not, let's say, that self-aware and knows, you know, that this is a bad road to go down. They get sucked into that life real quick, and we see it on the news every day. You know, We see a new person on the news every day that goes down that road, and then all of a sudden six months later, they lose all that money because they're, they're motivated by all this crap, you know, women, drugs, blah, 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 all this nonsense. And all of a sudden, like you never hear from them anymore. You know? so, so what I'll say to that is that, is that I, 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 eat it, I ate into it at some point, you know? especially when I was in New York. 
you know, when I was in New York, we we were living a crazy lifestyle. I am telling you, man. The 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 people that would you'd see at this loft on a daily basis, it was absurd, absolutely absurd. The the things that happened at this place were absurd. Um, you know, but it was a great, it was a great, it was a great experience. It was all great experience, but it really does teach you a lot about yourself when presented in that situation. Cause most people don't have to deal with that. And it's so easy for other people to look at you and say, oh, you should have done this. You should have done that. It's like, dude, you never had that. You never, you never been in that position to be making any kind of statements about what you would or wouldn't do. You know, and I always said it in one of my posts too. It's like, people are hypocrites. You know, it's so easy for a poor person to look at a, 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 a level of, of uh, you know, somebody who was rich, who was sitting on a couple million dollars or $10 million or whatever and say, oh, he's doing this and oh, he's doing that. It's like, dude, if I put that kind of money in your, in your pocket right now, you would turn into an even worse person, uh, you know, but you don't know that, you know, because most people haven't been in that situation. Um, so, dude, I would say I gave into it for a little bit. But, dude, I realized pretty quickly that, you know, it's all it's all bogus. You know, it's all bogus. And it's more about what you want to do with your life. How do you want to spend your life? What makes you happy? You know, and and if it's all that nonsense, going to the club and spending money and, you know, being in this sort of public eye and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's great. But that shit is not going to last that long. And it's not going to feel that great when, you know, five years from now, six years from now. Yeah, it's funny. Like you hear this sort of thing happening sort of all the time, like you mentioned, but you know, you sort of never really think it will happen to you. I mean, I can't speak from experience where I'm at right now, but, um, you know, did you sort of get that, um, like you never sort of pictured that would happen to you as you were coming oh, up? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, dude. Like I never, I never knew that was going to happen to me. I, I never knew, I never, I never accounted for it. I never understood it, you know? And I always, out, I always boldly stated like, dude, I'm not going to be like that. I remember always telling myself like, I'm never going to be like that. And then all of a sudden when it's there, it's in your hands and you have that power and people look, looking at you like that. It's like a drug. It's almost, it's almost like a drug. And you can see how people are easily addicted to feeling that way and if you give into it like that is always i would say what 99 times out of 100 it's always it always ends up in a shit in a shitty situation somehow some way it always does it always does and i can say that from firsthand experience too all right man this is this has been awesome so let's um we're sort of getting towards the end of the interview but i've just sort of got one more question and then we'll take it to the sure. closing bill so why do you believe the majority of traders never see the huge success we set out to achieve in the first place? Yeah, yeah. And and I will say purely, you know, and, and, and trying to come up with the root of that. Like, dude, I've been I've been thinking about that a lot. Like there's so many different ways to attack the that question, you know. So some people might say ego, some people might say this, some people might say that. You know, and I think I think it's people never truly know what they want out of life, right? And if you're going to be a trader and you want this success, right? Most people just say, "Hey, I want a million bucks," or "Hey, I want two million bucks." And I can say firsthand that you know, making a million dollars, it didn't give me any, <laughs> it didn't give me any purpose in life. It didn't, it didn't achieve. It. I, I didn't, I didn't make it, and all of a sudden, been like, yes, I'm good now. I've achieved this, and I'm fine. Like it had nothing. It there was nothing there. I felt nothing. I felt absolutely nothing. In fact, I felt pissed off because I didn't make the four million on the trade, and I made the fucking one million. You know what I mean? This was bullshit. It's complete bullshit when you have these dollar amounts that you want to get to. Because when you get there it's not about that so so people it, it every everybody has a different evolutionary cycle in the sense of how mature they are and where they hit that certain point where they really know what they want out of life so if you for example want a freedom from having to work you know that's a that's something that okay now you can go ahead and break down what it's going to take to achieve that so maybe it's okay making a million and then stashing that million, living a, a, a sort of a, a very easy lifestyle, 50 grand a year type thing, making small investments, and then you never have to work. You know, that's something that you can pull off. But if it's something where you just want to make money, remember, it goes back to the motivation for making the trade. And, and that's what I that's what I will always come back to. What is your motivation for making that trade? And if that motivation is not is not defined and it's not, you know, it's not true in, in its purpose, then it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how much money you make. 
you're going to end up fucking losing it. You're, you're going to end up losing it or you're going to end up doing something else stupid simply because like you don't, uh, you don't know truly what you're after. You don't, you don't know what you're going for. You know, so most traders are just like, dude, I just want to make money. I want to make money. I want to make money. And that is a debilitating way to go about trading because if all you're motivated by is fucking money, then guess what you're going to do? You're going to make horrible decisions in the market all the time because you're motivated by, oh, I got to play this earnings call, which is, which is, which is horrible, you know, which is a gamble at the end of the day. Oh, I got to make money today, even though there's nothing, there's nothing going on. So you're just going to rack up all these losses. All of a sudden you got two blown accounts. Now you got to go back to work. And what are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to stash money here for a trading account on the side because you want to get out of work. What makes you think that you're going to make better decisions? Because now you're under the gun and you got a fucking job and now you want to get out of your job. You know what I mean? People don't make good decisions when they're strapped down and they don't understand what their purpose is. And that's what I found out through so many years of up and down trading and through so many years of wanting different things, you know? So ego got me pretty far. Ego got me pretty far. But there's no way ego is going to make me $10 million or $20 million. There's no fucking way ego is going to make me that much. You know, the maturity now and, and the understanding of what kind of life I want to live, that's what's going to get me there. That's what's going to get me there and stop making uh, uh, you know, rash decisions in the market. Again, making, making decisions playing stocks from bad motivations. You know, so that's what I, that's what I would end that with. Yeah, man, that's that's awesome. So, so much good advice through this interview. I really, really appreciate you coming on again. No so, um, let's just take it to the closing bell, which is just a, about uh, four questions, and we just sort of ask them to all the guests. So, first one: um, What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? <sighs> man, this is such a. I hate questions like this too, man. <laughs> best advice I'd ever received, man. Uh, <sighs> Man, I would say relax. Be patient. Actually, yeah, that's the best advice I've ever I've ever received. Be patient in all forms, in all walks of, in whatever you do. Be patient. If you if you sit there and just bang on the desk keys, whatever it is in life that you're trying to do, if you if you force any situation or you go after it too aggressively, uh, you know it has unintended consequences. So be patient, man. You know it's gonna come to you no matter what if you're true in nature and purpose. I like it. I like it. Awesome. So what is the, the number one trading resource you rely on each and every day that you probably, you know, would struggle without? Uh, as far as like news, as far as what? As far as like a platform or something like that? Yeah, anything. I mean, um, yeah, something that you rely on the most. So, um, yeah, maybe a trading platform um, sort of. Yeah. Uh, maybe I the tape say- in your case. Yeah, tape for me. Yeah, tape for me. That that would be it. That's what I rely on every single day. I wake up in the morning and I look at tape. I I go, I go to bed at night and I look at fucking tape. So that's it. If I didn't have a time in sales in my life, I wouldn't be able to make money. <laughs> fair call, cool, fair call. Cool. So, um, what is one book you believe would be a good read for um sort of an entry level trader? Maybe something around the topic of understanding uh, market structure better. I would say Dark Pools. I would say Dark Pools. Dark Pools is so – it's such an awesome story. It has suspense. It has characters, uh, and it is so cool. It is such a cool book. Now, you know, for the newbies, you know, there might be a little stuff – there might be some stuff that goes over their head. But again, it's it's written so well that it's just it's just right on, man. It's perfect. Awesome. That's that's definitely what I'm going to check out for myself, actually. I'm, I'm yeah. keen to read Ab- that. Absolutely. Um, so knowing everything you do now – what would you have done differently come day one again? Man, uh, I would have been more patient, bro. This goes back to number one. This goes back to number one. I would have been more patient. And again, when you're young, like being young is rooted in, in ego. It's rooted in, uh, you know, is, is thinking that you know more than you actually do. And, and you know this as a, as, as a younger fellow. And, and I, you know, I, my daughter is almost 10, you know, and I look at her and her ego is fucking ridiculous, man. It is ridiculous. <laughs> you know, it's blind. It's so blinding, you know? So when you're 20, 21, 22, 23, all that kind of stuff, you know, you don't, you don't know anything. You know, and and you think you know so much and you literally have to get beaten down and then you finally come into who you should be. When you get beaten down, that's when you finally come into who you should be. So I would say, you know, 
the person who gets beaten down earliest, meaning, you know, if, if that happens at 19 or 20 or whatever, you know, those are the guys that are really going to make something happen. And so that happened to me too. So, you know. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Again, Luchi, man, thanks so much for coming on. Um, no before problem. we before we go, do you just want to share with listeners where they can um, find out more about you, uh, more about Sang Lucci and, you know, yeah, where, where they can connect? Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm, we're at Sang Lucci everything. You know what I mean? So, so you find us on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook. Everything is at Sang Lucci. Uh, the website is also sanglucci.com. But honestly, the Twitter feed is the best place to just get an idea of, of who we are, what we talk about, uh, you know, and the culture. Because we're, 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 we're a lot more about lifestyle. We're not just about trading. And that's one, that's one of the things that we diversify ourselves as far as any, everybody else out there. You know, we're, we're so much more than just traders and that's one thing that we're trying to bring to fruition in 2015 and going forward you know more of the lifestyle thing like who we are as people uh and who you need to be as a trader you know you can't just sit behind your desk anymore and just and just flop around uh you know there's there's a community out there uh you know and there's a lifestyle behind it so that's kind of what we portray so yeah at saying lucci everything man awesome man well all those links will be in the show notes anyway at chatwithtraders.com cool. so you'll be able to find everything there all right. Thanks again, Lucci. We'll um we'll keep in touch and speak soon. All right, Aaron. Sounds good, man. All right, guys. I hope you all enjoyed that interview. Lucci gave a ton away, as I'm sure you heard. Very, very smart dude. Now, I just wanted to do a quick recap on the giveaway we're running at the moment. So it has actually kicked off, and what we're giving away is the Lucci method. So one person is going to win this. Now, what this includes is unlimited access to over 75 training modules in an online course. In each module, there is videos, there is written material, there is charts, and you know there's, there's more as well. This takes you right through from the basics of learning options to the finer details on how Lucci actually trades in the markets today. Also included is two months access to the Sang Lucci chat room. This is an incredible community. Everyone gets the same respect, regardless of your level of trading. Lucci is in there uh, throughout the day, talking through his trades and things he's watching. And also, as part of the chat room, you also get the market regime report. And that's a video you get two times a week. On top of this, you also have two months access to the weekend sessions, which are really cool. This is two hours each weekend with Lucci when he reviews his trades and goes over any interesting tape movements that have come up in the past week. And it's all done on a live webinar, so you can ask uh, questions at any point and um, he'll explain it in greater detail if you, you, know, you don't understand anything or there's something you're getting stuck on and want to know more about. Um, and then finally, the guys are also going to throw in a one-hour coaching session with Zach Hurwitz. And I mentioned at the start, like this guy is just crazy when it comes to trading VWAP. Um, and that's volume weighted average price. Um, I'm going to have him on the show in a couple of weeks time and he'll run right through that. Very, very smart guy. So keep your ears out for that one. Um, now, also the package is for sale on their website right now for $2,699. But we've got one to give away. So... To enter, just go to chatwithtraders.com forward slash giveaway. There'll be one question there. You've got to answer it. It's very simple. You won't get it wrong. Trust me. Um, enter your email address following that. And once you do this, you'll instantly be entered. This will give you one entry to the giveaway. It'll also give you a unique URL. And the idea is you need to share this like mad. And I'm going to tell you why. The more you share this URL and the more people you can get to enter from clicking your URL, the more entries you get. So for every one person you get to enter through your unique URL, you get 10 entries. So let's say you get 10 people to enter, then your chance of winning is actually 100 times greater. Pretty cool, right? All right, now the competition will end at 7 p.m. on the 8th of March, Eastern Standard Time. So get busy, guys, and um, don't wait on it. Um, awesome, awesome prize. Um, and again, in case you missed it, go to chatwithtraders.com forward slash giveaway to enter. All right, awesome. Thanks a lot, guys, for tuning in, and I look forward to speaking to some of you in the meantime and um, again next week. Peace. 
You've come to the end of this episode of Chat with Traders. But don't worry, more great episodes are on the way. To stay updated with each great new episode, be sure to subscribe to the podcast in iTunes. And we'd love it if you leave us a rating and review. We'll see you next time on Chat with Traders.